what I want to do now is to look at some of the things that go into the categorization of sounds. So what we know is that the speech, the speech stream is a complex set of infinitely varying pieces of information. Yet, just like we do with vision, where we give a meaning to the information that we get from our visual senses, and that meaning doesn't come entirely from the physical stimuli. The same thing happens with sounds, and the same thing happens with how we understand concepts in general. So what I'm focusing on here is, well, one of the things I'm going to be focusing on is the alveolar stop sounds and how that's categorized. So here's a, a little picture of the alveolar stop being made. Uh -huh. So notice that the tip of the tongue is just behind the teeth on that. You can see there's like a white area just behind the teeth that counts as the alveolar ridge. So the tip of the tongue is going up on the alveolar ridge, completely stopping the airflow through the vocal tract. So that's, what we're, that's one of the things that we're looking at in this next um, set of slides. So let's take these two objects. What we've got here is two things that people sit on. They're both comfortable things to sit on, things for kind of lounging in, and um, they have like cushions and they're padded. But one is for three people, apparently, because it's sectioned off as if to seat three people. And the other one is for one person in contrast. So are those the same kind of thing? Or do they belong to the same category? Well, not according to English, because that one would be an armchair and the one that's for one person. And that the other one is a sofa or a couch. And what's the difference? The critical difference is how many people does it seat? So we kind of go nuts with this in English, or at least in American English. There are armchairs, sofas or couches, and then which are typically for three or more people. But then we also have another word for the same kind of object that is for two people only, or apparently for two people only, and we call that a love seat. But that's not a necessary way of categorizing these things. If we go to Portuguese, these things are, um, don't focus, in Portuguese you don't focus on the number of people that the thing seats. What you focus on is the purpose that it's for. So these are for lounging or for relaxing, um, for taking it easy, whereas other kinds of structures like this that are for dining or for working in an office would have a different word, which would be equivalent to more or less equivalent to the English word chair, the more generic word. Um, but um, in this case, these things are all categorized as one thing, sofa. And um, the, the reason for this is that the, the focus is on the purpose of the, of, the, of the item. And I know this is true because my wife, even after having been, even after having lived in the United States for more than 30 years, is Brazilian and speaks Portuguese as her native language, and doesn't get the difference even today between sofa and couch and armchair. She doesn't use the word armchair. When she wants me to move the armchair from one place to another, she says, could you please move that sofa? And so why is that? Because the, her, her past experience when she was learning language, learning language for the first time, Everything told her that her culture and her language told her that these are the same kind of thing. And that's a kind of knowledge that's hard to let go of. Languages and cultures can um, do things in different ways. And this goes for the whole range of objects in the world. 
what what they are and what category they belong to and which things are alike and which things are different are not facts about the world. They're facts about our language and culture and our minds. So let's look at the language, the way this works in language and um, zeroing in on the alveolar consonant sounds and how they can be um, different in different languages. Ah, uh, da, uh, da. Ta, ta, da. So, Thai has distinguishes three different kinds of alveolar stop sounds. English only distinguishes two in terms of uh, in terms of the categories of sounds that matter. The categories of sounds that we need to pay attention to in order to understand the meanings of different words and distinctions between different words. So in English, there is an aspirated, the T with the little superscript H is an aspirated sound. You make that without voicing, so it's a voiceless sound. But as you, as you, you, you put, you bring your tongue up to the alveolar ridge, and as you release it, there's a brief delay before the voicing of the vowel starts. So voicelessness for the for the consonant sound, completely stop the air flow, release it, and what you hear is the nature of that release. But with the aspirated stop, there's a slight delay during which the vocal cords start to open and air passes through as if it's making an H sound. And then the voicing begins later. So there's the delay in between that. With the voiceless, unaspirated stop, what happens is that the release occurs and then voicing begins immediately. So in English, there are contexts in which you get the unaspirated T and P and K sounds, the stop sounds, the voiceless stop sounds. There are contexts in which you get those. One context where you clearly get the unaspirated stop unaspirated voiceless stop is when you have an S preceding the, um, the T, P, or K sound in, um, in a stressed syllable. So still, still has an unaspirated stop, till has an aspirated stop.